Don't be worried about sounding like you're bragging. You need to tell the truth of what you do so people can really understand it. And I think for sure, we don't want to say like, oh, I was in the office, you know, all the blah, blah, blah. But we do have to say, in order to increase student success and retention, you have to see your students. And here's what that takes. It's not chat bots and it's not automatic emails and it's not all these other things. It is a person being present. Good afternoon, everybody. Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success at Ferris Resources. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Cap and Gown. I'm very excited about our episode today because Dr. Sherry Woosley is joining me, and we always just have a great time together. Um, <clears throat> so, looking forward to inviting her on after we do State of the Union. A couple of things that I want to tell you about. We are doing a webinar on Thursday around five um, impact, five high impact practices for student success. So I'd love for you guys to join me on that. You can see the QR code. Um, if you're listening to us wherever you listen to podcast later on and you're like, oh, that sounds good. I would like to have that. Then we will make sure we include it in our follow up resources for you. Um, let's see what else I'm kind of talking to myself, but not really because all of my friends have joined us and we have a bunch of people in the background. Um, but it's always so nice to see everybody joining us on LinkedIn live. So thank you for taking time out of your day. We are seriously on the home stretch. We are just like looking down the barrel to the end of the semester. And so I know so many of you are doing your um, registration processes and trying to get a better picture of what your retention is going to look like. So Thank you for joining me in this busy time. You guys, I told you last week that I was done with our joy words. Like I wasn't going to be responsible for those anymore, that I was going to give that to Matt, but he's not joining me today. So I have to do them again. But you will notice that I have picked very short, easily pronounceable words. So let me give you our three joy words and then we'll do State of the Union. The first one is Sisu. It is Finnish. And it is extraordinary determination and grit, especially in the face of adversity. So I love that one. Another one you've heard us talk about quite a bit is kintsugi. This is Japanese, and it is the art of repairing broken pottery using gold lacquer. You remember that in 2021, our theme for the year was kintsugi because we were thinking about so many things that had been broken. <clears throat> and changed and how we could come back and make a beautiful repair to create something that um, was really uh, meaningful and valuable, even though it had been broken. And then the last one is Creole. It is Mojo. And Mojo is a magical charm or spell or personal magnetism. So three very easy to pronounce words for me today. Um, and next week we will have Matt do our joy words. Okay, let's get started with State of the Union. My first State of the Union for you today is actually, I, I don't have a slide for this one because I started to read, it's called A Virtual Culture of Care. I started to read about this initiative of all of these big colleges who are trying to figure out how to provide care for students. They were like, you know, I think we should like wear name tags and we should do a warm referral, which is where if a student needs something, we don't just like tell them that's in that building across campus, but we take them to the referral place that were like the counseling center or tutoring center or whatever. We should walk them there. Um, they were like, you know, faculty really should learn students' names and they should have meetings with them outside of the classroom. It shouldn't just be classroom stuff. We should have special t-shirts that we have. And then I got halfway through this article and I was like, these are things that our schools all do really, really well, right? The schools that have a smaller population that are focused on holistic support of students, we preach, I mean, this is preaching to the choir, right? We need to connect with students. We need to be present for them. I like this article because it's talking about these data-driven little things that you can do to make students feel seen, but we're beyond this, right? We've done all of these little kind of check the box things and we're moving on to a bunch bigger things. So I'm going to take this article as a, we're doing a great job and there are some really, really big schools who are trying to learn how to provide the kind of student success uh, support that you guys are already doing a fabulous job. So great work on that. 
Okay, here is, um, this is a, an article that I have been trying to do for four weeks, but it's so robust that I have not been able to fit it in. But I wanna tell you about uh, York College, which is in Pennsylvania. They have a very new president who has been investing in the town by using something that they call community-based learning. So this is basically, she's like, as our school goes, the town goes, as the town goes, we go. We want to find some very specific community problems that we can apply our students to so that they can get this um, real world experience. And we want to be great neighbors and have a great community. So they work with community members and students to find um, current social, business, and governmental programs uh, problems. So they are merging classroom learning with community interactions. They have to be a real community need. They have to use data to inform their decisions. They are led by students and mentored by teachers. And they have to have a task or a process and the opportunity for reflections on learning, as well as an actual product that they're creating. So this is how are you good neighbors with the people in your community by using this CBL approach. A great example of this is um, in the Goodridge Freedom Center, they have a stop, there's a site in Yorktown on the, uh, in York of the Underground Railroad. And this center is like, hey, but nobody knows about it. We don't know how to talk about it. We don't have good materials. So they worked with students in order to change the website. They did, they created a presentation that they could have, as well as here's your plan for how you're going to market this and make it more accessible to people in our town because it really is a hidden gem. So such a great example of this sort of enmeshment of a school and their community neighbors and really solving real problems, which, you know, um, group work sometimes can be really frustrating, but if you are trying to do something, trying to accomplish something in real life, I just think it is such a great approach to uh, helping our students learn in the real world. Okay, um, let's see. Oh, this was really, really interesting to me. This is an article from Inside Higher Ed that comes out of the um, Central Michigan University who has an academic Senate committee called the Multicultural Diversity and Education Council. They ran 15 panels of students who had something that was true about them. So for example, they talked to students of color, students with ADHD, students who had anxiety, veterans, first generation college students, international students, former foster care students, rural students. They just were like, hey, we want to hear about what these different student populations can teach us about our campus and about our practices. Um, it's like the awards letter that we talked about last week, right? Where it's not universal. Some people like this and then some people like this, this format better. So they just listened to them. Five things that came out of that. Um, first of all, students make determinations about how supportive they perceive their instructor to be before the first class. So these students said, although it is true that most students don't read the syllabus before the class starts, if you are at all nervous about the, the class, or if you are worried about how you're going to fit in, you do read the syllabus and you're looking for language like, what is the policy related to late work? Or do they sound like they're really going to be harsh or they sound more approachable? And so um, you remember I gave you a resource a couple weeks ago about how you can change your syllabus to be more inviting to students and at the same time give them the um, strengths language of you can be successful here. So that's the first thing is that they're looking in the syllabus to see whether or not this is gonna be a class they can be successful in. There's a lot of talk about flexible course policies. So like, can I turn it in late? Can I turn it all in at the end of the semester? This one's a little iffy for me because although there are some cases where that's helpful, We've talked about a lot of research that says allowing students to just continually delay and put things off actually can put them in a lot of success debt. And so that one we want to be careful about. Group work doesn't make the dream work. So they said we really don't like when we have to choose our own groups. We would appreciate it if faculty would form groups for us and then give us some insight about the different roles on the groups. That kind of helps us understand what we're supposed to accomplish as well as we're not like the last person chosen for the team. 
Um, and then the last one is office hours are intimidating and confusing. These students who took advantage of office hours, or as they're calling it, student hours, they were like, that was awesome. It was so great to see my faculty member out of the classroom, but they weren't sure about how um, uh, other students were like, I'm not sure about how to go about that. And so suggestions like online meetings, can you use a calendar link so that they can come and just say, hey, I want to meet with you during this time. That article, I think, is worth a read because it just talks about all of the details of that. All right. And then the last one I'm going to do for us today is leveling the playing field for social capital. Um, we've had a lot of conversation about social capital as defined by the strength of a student's relationships that provide support, information, and opportunity. Oftentimes, this promotes students through to be successful. This article talks about it in terms of the dark matter of opportunity because you can see the effects, but it is very hard to spot and measure. Um, many first-generation low-income underrepresented students have limited access to these networks. And so this article is about how can we kind of stand in the gap of uh, what's happening with those students. There's lots of technical, um, like technology solutions that are in this article, but it's interesting because the conclusion is that LinkedIn is really the most helpful resource because that is real people connecting with real people. And so helping your students use LinkedIn really well is an important investment. But this sentence, I need to meet this woman because this sentence is like, I just want to burn it on the wall in every place in our office. I'm going to start saying it all the time. She's talking about how we're trying to outsource with chatbots and, and AI and kind of like low uh, people resourced um, things for these students. And she says, the chat bots are not going to give you a job down the line. If we routinely look for the cheapest way to provide student support through non-relationships, we are going to continuously fail students who most need relationships to help them get by and get ahead, which I love so much. This idea that we've got to be connected with real people who can see us and help us walk through to be successful. Uh, I love. So, that is the State of the Union, um, which I'm particularly happy to say because it means I can invite my friend, uh, Dr. Sherry Woosley, in to talk to me about our subject today. Hey, Sherry. Hello. Is that your art behind you? I didn't yeah. ask you before. Yeah. yeah. My new wall. No. <laughs> oh, good. I like it because every time I talk to you, we mix it up a little bit. Yeah. I've got different things going on. Um, well, thank you for joining me. I am so excited about this topic today because we are always talking to our listeners about how they have to tell their story of success. Mm -hmm. And then we just say like, hey, good luck with that. And so when you and I were saying the other day, what should we talk about? And you guys, Sherry sent me just a PowerPoint of like, here's all the books I'm reading and what I'm thinking about. And I was like, this fits perfectly in this time of the year. And with this idea of there is science behind telling our story of success, and we want to give you some books and some tools and just have some rich conversation about how you can do that well. So um, I want to start with why we are always preaching about telling your story of success. I think of this as the privilege of knowing what's happening on your campus with your students, because not everybody on your campus does know that, right? You have the privilege of receiving these precious stories of overcoming adversity, of what's happening in students' lives, of the successes that they're having, of the ways that they're growing. And it really is a trust. I mean, it's like I'm holding these I have to then help everybody else on the campus understand our students' experience because you may not have that privilege, right? And so just that idea of I have to be the mouthpiece of what's happening with our students, I think is so important. Well, it, it validates our work. So it sort of helps boost everybody up too about why we're here, why this matters, why we have to be here. Not just anybody, but we have to be here. That's exactly right. And I really think of that as a responsibility. I, I think like when I'm thinking about my team at Ferris, 
I have the privilege of talking to our clients all the time and they'll say, this was an awesome thing you did, or, oh, I love this thing that you built, or this is how it's making an impact. And my responsibility is to go back to my team and say, hey, this is what they're saying about how we're helping them in student success, right? Exactly the same thing that we would say about you telling your story of success on campus. Yeah. Um, also, I think it's really funny. I don't know if you've had this experience before, but so often we see the tip of the iceberg of the work that has to be done. And I'm sure everybody has had like, somebody's like, hey, can you just really quick blah, blah, blah. Like, can you just really quick check on the student? And you're like, do you know <laughs> what is involved in checking on that student? Well, if you're not telling the story, then they would have no idea of that, like all of that machinery that's going on underneath, right, when we're managing um, our students. So I just think it's really, really important to be able to tell the work that you're doing and make it transparent. Um, anything you want to add about why we're trying to, to help people with these tools to tell a story? Um, okay, so can I tell you the Joanna thing that, that yeah. is fascinating? Okay, so because when you said, what do you want to talk about? And I said, I'm reading all these different books. I think one of the things that was, um, that has, I don't know, different things hit you different times a year, different whatever, is how many people are talking about telling stories from different perspectives, right? Yeah. Like you, you've got the, and we'll talk some more about, you know, the artist who says, this is how you tell stories. The writer who says, this is how you tell stories. The people who are talking about change theory, this is how you tell stories. Um, and the big one for me that is hitting everywhere along with all these others is um, this Joanna book because Joanna Bloor came out with a book, The Tales of Potential. And the thing that hit me is she talks about how often we talk about the past stories, the past stories. And I think there's a role for the past stories. And this is the time of the year where we need to tell the celebration stories. These are all the things that we did to yeah. celebrate. But one of the things that she's got me really thinking about with this book is that the past stories are a celebration story, but they don't always set up the future. And some of our leaders can hear a past story and say, oh, yeah, this fits into our strategy for next year. Right. And some of them can't. Yeah. So I think the critical thing is really about what story we're trying to tell this year, this year or this instance or this place and including not only the past, but the vision for the future the tale of the potential for next year, and then all the different tools to do it really well, that you don't have to be an expert in all those tools, but every one of those tools could help you. Yeah, I love that because the the movement of a story, the movement of a presentation has to be that we both say, here is what is, yeah. and imagine if, right? Imagine if we lived or if we worked on a campus where, every student was connected to somebody who saw them and provided support. Imagine what that would be like, right? So that idea of here's where we are, which is we have a lot to celebrate, but I'm going to cast this vision of the potential yes. I think is so powerful. And I don't know, Sherry, I think we forget about it sometimes. Like we're so busy in telling what we've done that we forget to say, oh, and if I could make it how it should be, or, or if you take something away, I can't create this again next year. Or like, like, I think we forget that part of it because we believe telling the past sets up the next. And sometimes it doesn't. Or sometimes, okay, I, like, and I've been guilty of this, so I'm not like criticizing <laughs> leaders, right? Where I'm already thinking about the future and I'm thinking about how that fits. And what if that's not how you want it to fit? Yeah. So you better start helping me understand your vision for the future so we can get aligned and create this potential. So I, I think it's both, but we can't assume telling a past story, a celebration story sets up what we want. Yeah. And I, and I, that makes me think about the difference between the magic wand approach to the future and the making the work transparent to what it will take to get there, right? Because a lot of times when we talk about our celebration story, we say we increased student success and it was awesome. We don't say 
and it took us this many hours in the semester and this many people, and here's what we didn't do because we were focused on these, right? And so this idea of casting the vision and also providing the support for leadership to say, if that's where we want to go, here's what it's going to take us in order to achieve that, right? Don't you think, too, at some level, we we think that... Well, we think we should tell the story of the celebration and not the work because we don't want to sound like we're complaining. But if we make it look too easy, then they're not going to actually value the work. That is exactly right. I I really appreciate that. I was just listening to uh, who's the everybody rights woman. We're going to talk about Anne that. Handley. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking or I was listening to her in preparation for this. And she was so good at saying like we would say when we interviewed presidential scholars right on a campus, like. Don't be worried about sounding like you're bragging. You need to tell the truth of what you do so people can really understand it. And I think for sure, we don't want to say like, oh, I was in the office, you know, all the blah, blah, blah. But we do have to say, in order to increase student success and retention, you have to see your students. And here's what that takes. It's not chat bots and it's not automatic emails and it's not all these other things. It is a person being present, right? So I totally agree with that. Um, so I just am thinking my my encouragement to our listeners is always I know you guys are doing good work yeah. and the taking the time out to tell the story of past celebrations and cast a vision for the future and uncover the work that you're doing for the rest of the campus is one more thing to do. And I know that that's really hard because you have other things to do. But I don't know if you found this with your schools yet, Sherry, but I am hearing summer projects left and right. We are at the point in the semester where everybody is thinking like, okay, here's what I want to accomplish this summer. And I feel very strongly that our practitioners need to decide on a conference proposal or a newsletter mm -hmm. or a white paper or just like an infographic Something. or where are you going to capture the work that you have been doing? I think it has to be a summer project because, you know, Matt and I are always talking about, does the president know the work that you're doing? Yeah. If no, then we have to give him something consumable so that he can understand what's the effort, right, that you're making. So my challenge is you've got to pick a place to be able to tell that. Love it. Love it. And some people are writers and some people want to stand up in front of everyone. But I think, I mean, I work to a deadline, man. I need, if I'm going to tell a story, I need to know what is the deadline that I have to have it together to be able to tell that story. So that's the first thing. You need to find a place where you're going to be able to tell your story. And then we always talk about every time I do a presentation, I think about the arc. I think about how I'm going to move the listener through this journey, right? Because you have to start in a place and then you have to go to a place and then you have to end up in a place. And sometimes when you go to presentations, there's so much fact telling. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. yes, that's my response. Sometimes you go to a presentation and you're like, I don't know why I care about this. And all you're doing is reading your slides and I don't, there's no story here, right? There, there's a concept in storytelling, um, progressive complications. Okay. And each progressive complication should move you a step forward. That's how I think about some of the data fire hoses that we see. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude, but that last, that next one is just the same as the last one. It didn't actually step me forward. Ooh. Progressive complication. I love that. Actually, I have a great example of that. Um, Trey, will you show the impact cohort piece? Because this, I was trying to think about how I use data to, to explain a story. Because, Sherry, I mean, there are some people who just really love data. They just want to live in the data. But most of the time, your audience wants to understand yeah. why and what, like, what are we, what does this tell me now, right? So this is an example when I do a presentation about impact cohort, which is where we go in and we say, historically, this is the, these are students who haven't retained as well, different buckets, all the variables, right? Yeah. Here's the retention rate in the students. And so I would say, here's our deliverable to you. We're going to give you these five different buckets. And then because you work them, we look at this retention rate. And we can see in each of these different buckets, here's where the, the retention rate is based on this historical data. And then we go through and here's what we did. 
We had weekly meetings with them. We did this, we did this. And then we moved them to a almost 13% increase of that entire cohort, which is 23 students, which is 5% overall increase in retention. I could have told you all of those numbers without a story and they would not be interesting, right? It'd be like, oh, this group, 35%, look, now it's this. Instead of saying, we found them, we did this stuff and look at the difference in the number of students that we have on our campus. So that's a great example of let's move you to a place instead of just put up a bunch of graphs. Yeah. Also, I don't, I have a pet peeve about when I see a graph, I know that the speaker a lot of times has seen it 50 times, but I literally have no idea what I'm looking at. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and, and there is, there is good research and advice in the data visualizations, like industry, right? Like, or, or the people who focus on that and they talk about different kinds of graphs for different types of, you know, messages, you yeah. use a pie chart when you want people to understand how a piece fits into the whole. You use a bar chart to compare different groups. So there's a whole lot of um, wisdom in those spaces. Yeah. And I think sometimes, um, well, it, my colleague and I, we were joking. Friends don't let friends use templates. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Because the template has a story in its head that may or may not match yours and the colors may not work. All the little lines, all the little, it's, it's hard. So the more you can strip away, the faster you can get it, the better it can be. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And there's the, you know, I'm always talking about brain calories and capacity to yes. absorb. I can understand what you're telling me, or you could just tell me. You know what I mean? I can I give me a minute. Let me look at what you are showing me, and I'm gonna. Or you can just say, "This is what we're looking at. This is the difference of each of these these pieces." Um. Okay. One more thing that I want to say, as our listeners are thinking about how to tell their story, I really love image slides when you are doing a PowerPoint with no words on them. So one of my favorite slides is our um, success stat. You know, Sherry, you and I have been talking about this forever. And Matt made me my most favorite slide with for success debt. And I love it so much because when you just use an image, first of all, you call up something in the person, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, you don't, I don't even need you to necessarily explain this to me. I can see. Yeah. But the other thing is I want you to pay attention to what I'm telling you. I don't want you to be reading my slide. So the idea that I can show you this and then take you on a journey mm -hmm. instead of having you look at my bullet points and then be like, I don't, I don't know really why you're talking because you're just saying what's on the slide, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I love that idea of just being able to drop in there this picture yeah. and uh, absorb it for a minute. And then I'm going to take you through what this idea of success does. I think it's a really powerful uh, mechanism when you're telling your stories. I think this also hits at memory because you hit an emotion and you're more likely to remember it with an emotion. You explain it. It's two words. Mm -hmm. um, we still use in, in my team, the phrase success debt. Yeah. And I think it comes from you. And I think it comes from that slide. Yeah. So powerful. Just yeah. any, any time. In fact, we were talking about the book made to stick right by cheap uh, chip Heath. Yeah. where he goes through and just says, there are some specific things you can do that will make what you're talking about sticky. Yeah. Well, and I don't know about you. I mean, this is a book I read. I don't know. It came out. I don't even know how long ago I read it. And we're working on right now um, a presentation for a housing conference in a few months. And we're talking about writing, right? And one of the guys who's a co-presenter said, we have to pull back out made to stick. And I don't know about you. I always kind of go, yeah, but it's kind of old. We should stay. <laughs> like, you know, like, I, I don't know. It's a sore point with me. Like, ah, uh, I don't know. And yet I pulled back out that darn book and I was like, I forgot a few things. Mm, I so love that. You, you take the things and he's, he, Heath and Heath have that list of six things that make an idea sticky and and stories is one of them. No question, stories. I remember stories. Yeah. Um, there are books that are 30 years old. I still remember stories from yeah. no question stories. They say emotions. And everything I've read said emotions are how you get things to stick. Um, I'll tell you the one I forgot. 
What? Unexpected. Ooh, that's good. To make an idea sticky, there has to be an element of unexpected. Because if it's just a no duh, then it's a no duh. I don't actually we need to remember it. So it doesn't need to be, I think, the whole idea, but there has to be something there that um, somebody uh, said to me that it, there has to be a disruptor mo moment to cause you to stop, to think, and go, oh. That's so good, Sherry. I was just thinking about, I do a presentation about why in our student success funnel, we do identify, connect, solve, and the measure why connect comes there. And that story is about a student who is absent from class. Yeah. And the student success coordinator sent him a email that was like, hey, where are you? What's wrong? And the student was like, I'm in the hospital. And the student success coordinator was like, okay, thanks. Bye. Which is the disruptor because everybody in the room is like, wait, what? Exactly. <laughs> it was not like, are you okay? What can I do for you? Right. Uh, um, I had six because you see it going down this path. And then all of a sudden, no, that's not at all what we would have imagined is going to happen there. And so you're going to remember that because it is so disheartening <laughs> that that was the, the response there. That's great. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about his, his conversation about stories. And I was thinking about as we're trying to teach people how to tell their story of success, mm -hmm. that this idea of the more specific our stories are, the, the better people remember them. And I think in the stories, you can weave in all of those other things that he talks about, right? How there's feeling and, and also stories are such a, touch point to then cast the vis the vision for the future. So I was thinking about the difference between me saying, yeah, when I was a practitioner, I would find students and I would help them. And telling you the story of one of my students who I had gotten all these referrals on and she would not respond to me. She, I couldn't get her to come into my office, but I had our system up and I, and so I knew what she looked like. And I was walking through the lobby one day and she was sitting in the lobby and I went over to her and I said, hey, Sarah, I'm Rachel. You've been getting emails from me. Can you come talk to me? So she came into the office and she had she was like all done up. And I said, I'm really concerned about you because all of these things are happening. Your faculty are telling me this. And, and she started to get very, very teary. And she said, hey, I really trust you. And there's a lot of awful things going on in my life. But I'm about to go to work. And I just did my eye makeup. And so I cannot cry. <laughs> Ah. Well, can I come back tomorrow because I need help? And I was like, do you promise you will come back tomorrow? And she said, yes, I promise. And I said, okay. And then she came and I saw her for four years. And I still see her. I She's one of my friends, right, that I spend time with. Telling that story and then saying, can you imagine if you had the resources to be able to be present with a student like that? Know them when you see them and say, this community loves you. We want you to come in and, and spend time with us. That is a totally different experience than me just saying like, yeah, you find students, you can help them, and then they go on to be successful, right? Absolutely. Tell me matters. No one is going to forget about this student who was like, my eye makeup, though. I can't, I can't cry about <laughs> it. Um, okay. So use stories. We want it to be sticky. We want to uh, leverage those stories so that people understand the kind of work you do and the kind of problems that you deal with on the campus. Um, and to help them in the future see students, I think, in a different way. Because that's the other thing is so often we just, we just, know about students. We just know about them. Like they're, they're underprepared academically or they're this or they're right. Instead of being like, let me tell you a story about what students actually go through yeah. and the kinds of struggles that they have. So that then in the future, when you run into a student who's having difficulty, you think about them in a different way. And that's that privilege we were talking about. You hold those stories. You have to, you have to tell them on campus. Okay, let's move to data. So okay. we've got to find good stories. We're going to mine our experience for those. We're going to tell them. We're going to move people from what is to what could be. But Sherry, I want you to talk about your shape language because this oh. is 
so fun. This is such a fun. Okay. Place. And this is not my shape language. It's Eric. So I have okay. to give Eric credit. <laughs> um, Eric Dussault and I did a presentation at um, NASPA. So like last month. And Eric is a director of student success and retention at Emerson. I, I probably got his title wrong. Sorry, Eric, but he's fabulous. <laughs> um, and he and I go way back and we paired up for this presentation because, you know, like, I like doing things about weird stuff. And <laughs> so this one was going to be about data visualizations, but the idea, because like data visualization, storytelling, all this stuff, there's the three big parts. There's the data, there's the visuals and the narrative. And I've done sessions on story storytelling and how we tell stories. I've done general sessions on visuals, but they tend to come more out of the data side of things. What charts do you use? What colors do you use that? And so Eric and I decided to really focus on the visual side of things. Eric is an artist and he is not only an artist, he's a trained artist. I'm an amateur artist. I just make stuff and throw it up behind me. Um, he actually teaches illustration. And so as you do, when you come to a collaborative presentation, you bring your part and your partner brings the other part. And he brought this shape language stuff. I had never seen it before. I'm now seeing it everywhere. So um, let's uh, move and I'll show you a couple of things he showed me because I, fascinating stuff. He says, shape language is a language. And so that's the thing that like, I don't, I don't know why I didn't know this. I've been doing art forever. Um, and he said, so the concept is that shapes alone, just the shape communicates something. Mm. So it communicates a message, it prompts emotions. And um, he's actually been teaching an illustration class. And so he and his class talk about how they use shapes in children's books. So three shapes, circles, squares, and triangles. Yeah. Circle, soft, safe, squishy, Mickey Mouse, squares, solid, to the point sometimes of inflexible, stubborn, Ooh. but also strong and stable. Um, the guy from Up, do you, do you see all the squares on him? Yeah. Yeah, they really overkilled the squares, didn't they? Um, fascinating to me on the triangle part. Triangle is about action. It is about disruption. And if you think about most villains in children's things, they are triangular or angular because they are disruptive. Mm, that's and that's the, that's the emotional response that these are shapes alone are communicating. Now, think about these in terms of data. Okay. Yeah. This is the part that I was like, wait, what? Um, so he says, look at circles communicate whether you mean to or not, safety, security, whatever. That's why you see so many kind of pie charts. Eric even said, and this one kind of blew my mind, he believes that's why we're moving more and more to donut shapes. They're safe. Hmm. And if you go to the true donuts, they've even cut out the angular part of it, which, okay. So yeah. if you want to communicate safety, you might want to think about circles. Yeah, so I would think, this kind of chart, especially as we're talking about our community and how we care for our students, right? Safety. That this idea of like, here's our people and here's what we've done for our students, mm -hmm. it would be a, a dynamic way to kind of convey that. And, and sort of a safer way. It doesn't prompt any sort of emotions. It's just, here's who we are. This yeah. is lovely, right? Yeah. Okay, so I had never heard this. That's why it was throwing me. Okay, so squares, we use them in bar charts all the time. And think about if this if this communicates sort of stability, hmm. that's why you can have a bar chart with a change and yet it doesn't feel scary. It's stable. It's right. even Measure. changes, comparisons. It's somehow got that stability to it. Okay, that's so now look at the the, the next one on the whatever. And by the way, if Eric ever sees this, he's going to be embarrassed by how fast I did this because he has <laughs> such a depth of knowledge and I'm just glossing things over. But this is dynamic, but this is also about action. So if you want people to move, these things happen. The reason he has the um, the heartbeat is that's often where it comes from. That's where we've seen it and we feel it. That's why it's dynamic. That's why it's whatever. Um, and then he talked about, okay, imagine doing combos. You want to communicate something. So if you look at the left, don't even pay attention to the data. Just look at the thing. You've got the stability, but
but then you've got the bouncing of that line, which yeah. makes people go. Ah! And if you don't want people to go ah! round it out, do the same. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that, does that just feel nicer? For sure. I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, in our system, we can see this on time spent or like when referrals come in and ours is rounded. It is like, okay, then you got to, you know, you got 15 referrals there and then you got another four there. And, but I'm, I'm wondering about in time spent, if we need to make it more triangular, because I think it actually reflects better what our practitioners feel, which is like, yeah, I was exhausted because I had this spike. Right. And then I did this and then I did this. So that is so interesting just to think about, like you said, the language of what it looks like. Well, and what struck me is I have seen things about the language of colors. Mm -hmm. That red is startling and that cool colors are calming. I had not before seen the language of shapes. And I do not know why it never occurred to me because I study art for fun and I think about focal points and structures and all kinds of stuff. So I, I at one level, I... I am stunned at how I see it everywhere now. One of my friends, I was showing them this because I'm a nerd. And she was like, what does it say about me that I love triangles everywhere? <laughs> You're like, quick to action. That's what yes, it is. <laughs> but I think the, the notion that that could account for sometimes when we show data and we get a reaction we don't expect. You know, where, where you're showing something that you don't think is alarming and people are like, wait, what about this? And then if you did it with a line that jumps, that could be why. Yeah. So, you know, it's so interesting to me that this happens occasionally in different areas where I'm like, well, I wonder if there's a way to, or if there's any thought about, right. And then you, and then you borrow from another yeah. area Just and they're like, yeah, yeah, there's there's some thoughts about it, Rachel. Yeah. Some people have thought about, right. How shapes make you feel and that sort of thing. But yeah. Because visual artists have only been around for right. centuries and centuries thinking about how to put things onto an image and, you know, yeah. and I'm like shapes. <laughs> it's so interesting. Yeah. But I also think as we're encouraging telling the story of success. You have people on your campus who have expertise in this. They have expertise in using data and how to build out a whole story using those visualizations. And so I don't want to jump to action items, but you always need, I've been talking about, I need an Excel buddy. Matt's my Excel buddy. When I have to do it, I'm like, Hey, I got to do this thing. And he's like, just, I'll, I'll help you with it. But you could build a whole you know, ad hoc team where you just say, we need to create yeah. something to help our, our campus understand the story of the work that we're doing. Or, or to have somebody from a very different discipline look at something and give you a reaction. They may not tell you it's the shapes, but, but they may tell you, <gasps> is my immediate reaction. Right. That you want to know before you hit a meeting. <laughs> This graph is stressing me out and I don't know why. Okay, why don't we, why don't okay, we round it out? Let's try something else. <laughs> um, okay, well, that leads us then into in the science of telling a compelling story, we've got to think about our visualizations, but also we have to think about how we can use numbers to create something meaningful. Yeah. Because in the same way we're saying in the beginning, like it shouldn't just be a data dump. You shouldn't just say like, here's all the data and there you go. We need to fit that into a story so that people can understand what's going on. So um, I've been reading this book, Making Numbers Count, also by Chip, uh, Chip Heath. Yeah. It is about how you can take data mm -hmm. and make it um, kind of bite-sized, make it human, give some context and do some comparisons so that people can really absorb when we're talking about numbers, this is why it's important. And this is what it actually means in the real world. And I will tell you, Sherry, I am, I think I'm kind of terrible at this. I'm going to give you some examples. These took me a really long time to come up with. So again, I'm, I need a buddy on how I'm going to do this. But the idea that you are putting in perspective the amount of time you spend on something making something personal okay. or using a human scale. Okay. So I want to give you some examples. I was looking at a report I got from one of our campuses about their referrals. So thinking about just a, a 
table where it's like, here's how many referrals, here's how many people made referrals year over year, or here's what they said the student is struggling. So if I were going to do this presentation, and my goal of my presentation would not be to, to do a scholarly paper where I'm like 0.2% of that. That's not what we're trying to do, right? No. We're just trying to share the what's happening on our campus. Okay, so here's what I would say. First of all, 53% of our employees made a referral last year. It doesn't matter what the number is, but when I say 53%, it's over half. Mm -hmm. And it makes me look at the other people in the room and go, is everybody, what, I, okay, well, I guess I better get with the program and start making referrals because the majority of you are doing it even by a small percentage. Okay, 220 students had a referral made on them. That's double the number of students identified through referral as 2019. So we've identified twice as many students using referrals this year as we did in 2019. That's about the same number of students that attended our orientation in August. So if you think about throwing a pizza party for those students, you would have to have 86 pizzas to feed all of the students that got a referral. So when I say that, I say, first of all, remember orientation, remember all of those students, those all represent a student that got a referral. And we make it human and concrete by saying it takes 86 pizzas to feed all of those students, right? That's language that in higher education, we know how many pizzas it takes to feed students. We're throwing pizza parties all the time. But trying to give them some context of that's a lot of students that we identified through this referral program, right? Um, you said earlier concrete. That is super concrete. Could you imagine trying to carry 86 pizzas? Right. That's right. what I love. I love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Okay, 71% of students on this campus had financial issues. That is enough students to fill Walling Lecture Hall or whatever your lecture hall is, right? I want you to think about this big classroom. Every seat would be full if we looked at our the number of students who had financial issues. Um, then we have 50 students on this campus struggled with life concerns like a crisis at home, the loss of a family member, or the loss of a friend. 50 students. So if you think about presenting that, let's say you're doing your faculty pre-session mm -hmm. and you have, you know, 12 tables mm -hmm. and you say one person at every table stand up, you each represent a student on our campus that had the loss of a family member or the crisis at home. That is making it personal because I'm looking at my table and I'm like, that's you. Like everything that you represent, a whole person. And then I can look around the room and see what that actually, what that representation is, right? So being able to make it personal and give these examples of, yeah, 50 students, but it's not 50 students. It's this person in front of you represents that, I think is so important. Okay, I have one more for you. Okay. My last one is, um, if we think about those 50 students, and on average, they had three people in their circle of care to care for them. And those people spent three hours with that student over the semester, right? That is 450 hours caring for those students, which is the equivalent of one person working full time for almost an entire semester on just supporting that group of 50 students, right? Okay. That's a great way to tell the story of how much work goes into supporting those students in a way that people can understand, not abstract, but concrete. One person, full time, the entire semester, working with those 50 students. So I don't know how great those are, because like I said, I don't think I'm that awesome. I, coming up yeah, with but that. I think they're pretty wonderful. And one of the things I love about the fact that you got down to one person full time all semester, that tells me the potential loss if we lose one person. Because sometimes you go, oh, one staff member for a semester, we'll just cover it. Right. That's the loss. That's, right? that's exactly right. And yeah. the resource spend. Yes. So, so I'm always thinking of effective and efficient. Can we be more effective and efficient? Mm -hmm. Because then we can lighten that load and, and support more students, right? But you, you've got to say, how do we find them? What do we do? And then what was the outcome? Did we keep all 50 of them? Because if we kept all 50 of them, that's a great resource spend, right? Yeah. 
But if we didn't, yeah. then we've got to rethink what we're gonna what we're gonna do for them. So I really love that. Okay, we're on the home stretch. So you are telling me about I have the old version of this book. There's a there's a revised version of this book, and it's important because things have changed in the last three years. Yes. Okay. So this book is Anne Handley. She's a writer. Like, okay, and this was my theme when I was telling you stuff is I'm pulling these things from different industries, different, whatever. She is an expert in writing and her background is marketing, but she writes newsletters. And by the way, one of the best newsletters I've like, it comes out every two weeks. I read it and I'm not in marketing. So that tells you good stories, concrete stories. But one of the reasons she decided to re to revise her book is, well, initially th she thought she was just going to update a few things. <laughs> <laughs> and she really, as she start got into it, realized writing has really changed. And I think the pandemic did a lot of this. Me too. Um, where and and she goes through some of the characteristics that writing is more informal now. It is more personal now. It is humor. But the thing that's so great about the book, if you haven't seen it, um, and don't get intimidated by it, it is 400 pages, but it is very well written, very easy to read, lots of bullet points, lots of whatevers, is there are so many concrete ideas in here. So we've been prepping for that session we're going to do about writing. And and we're literally going to like give people, here's an email, here's three tips revise this email on the spot. I love Take that. out every unnecessary word. Okay, weren't you the one who said the other day that if you get another three paragraph email, like, yes, I can't, I can't do it. Here's, here's, sorry, I wasn't going to go on this tangent, but since you've invited me, I will make it a very short tangent. I was thinking about how in the old days, emails used to be letters, yes. Like you would sit down and you would type a letter. Yeah. And if we, but our brains haven't changed because we're still, I get 250 letters every day. I need it to be like subject title. Like mm -hmm. here's what it is. Bullet points by, because yeah. I cannot do three, four paragraphs for email. Well, I, that's even why to me reading her um, newsletter is so interesting because newsletters used to be like newspapers. They'd have columns and sections and hers is just this narrative, personal, whatever. There's a couple sections at the end, but they're super short. They're like an interesting tool to try this week. Yeah. You know, so I think, I think there is a shift going here that, um, we would all benefit from. I totally on agree. both sides of the. Uh, there's um there's another piece. I saw an article that made me laugh. Um, somebody had done an interview of Jerry Seinfeld about why he did started doing comedians in cars getting coffee or whatever the thing uh, is. Mm -hmm. um, he said that in his world he believes that innovation comes from this exercise of think about what sucks. Yeah. <laughs> And so that's what I've been thinking about with writing. Think about what sucks. A big, long email. Uh, all this, like these dense texts. Uh, uh, I want bullet points. I want short and sweet. I want things highlighted. I want, sure. yes. yeah, help me get through it. I was, that's right. I was thinking about this, this understanding that we ha have all of a sudden, because in our system, you can see if a student's open emails and there's like this lore that students don't look at emails and it's not true. They do look at them. They look at them multiple times. They don't do what you ask them to do because it's overwhelming. Yes. And I've started to tell schools like, Hey, use text language and emails. Hi, you know, yes or no. Can you just pretend like it's a text message? It's not the medium. It's the letter that you are crafting for them. And they're like, I don't have time to read through all of that kind of stuff. So I think in general, yeah. you were saying something about it being informal. I honestly think because we all started Zooming from our houses and like meeting each other's pets and having each other's kids come through, yeah. but there's just like this veil that used to be there of like, this very like official. And when your cat walks through, you're like, sorry, you know, I'm at home. This is my cat. So I do think that we are moving towards a more personable, easily consumable language, yeah. um, which should be encouraging as you're thinking of telling your story of success, because it doesn't have to be an academic paper. You can just write like you're a real person trying to tell people, here's what I'm doing, you know, in my job. I think that that's really powerful. Um, 
I was thinking about, it's kind of like what I try to do for State of the Union, you know, where I'm spending two hours reading every article there is. And there's a place for those articles. I'm trying to cut out some of the work for you by just saying, here's an overview and what I think you need to know. And if you want to go look up, here's the article, right? Okay. So I have action items for our listeners. Um, the first one is you guys, please pick a medium to tell your story of success. So whether that's a conference or newsletter or just a paper or however you want to tell it, but now is the time to be thinking about that. Next is use data. Make sure that you have access to good data and it takes a long time to craft that data into something that is consumable. It's super easy just to be like, here's all the information. It's much, much harder to then translate that into something that someone's going to remember. Um, because it's sticky. Um, next, I would be thinking about how you're going to use images and storytelling to move the listener through. And this idea of bouncing between what has been and what is possible in the future, I think is really powerful. I love that so much. Um, find a partner. Got to find a partner who's going to help you with some of those things. And then um, two more for you. One is about knowing the percentage of retention increase on your campus, knowing how many students that is. So in other words, when we say you increased retention 1%, depending on the size of your campus, it's going to be between three and eight students, right? I mean, it could be much bigger, but, but saying we increased retention 1%, which means we have eight additional students, or saying our goal is to increase retention 5%, which is just 40 additional students. Putting it in student language, you should be talking about student success and retention always in terms of the number of students. If we want to increase retention, all we have to do is find five students, help them move through to success, and that will be really helpful. Um, we also think about that in terms of, uh, Matt and I were saying, it's almost like you plant, if you think about your retention number, you plant 100 trees, and then you go away, and then you come back and 30 of them are cut down. How, the, like, think about that image of like, these are cut down trees. We planted them and now they're not here anymore. That's a great way on campus to talk about why retention is important. Student success for sure, but we also want to be thinking about the investment in these students being able to be successful on your campus. So that's your other action item. How many students equals a 1% increase in retention? And then lastly, we have some great links from you, Sherry, about um, go and learn about how to do kind of data visualization from the experts. So I think, Trey, will you pop those up for us? This is a QR code. We'll put it um, where if you're listening on a podcast, you can find it. But so much good, serious information about how to use data visualization to tell your story. It's a great crash course, I think. And then also this, um, I love this, what storytellers know that housing professionals are still learning. That's that's an awesome one. I don't think I've heard that one. Oh, we're doing um, another version of it. If anybody is in New York City for NASPA Region 2 Conference, we're going to be doing one like it. Awesome. So, um, should be that. fun. Yeah, that'll be in person. So, you know. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. You know, I at the end of these conversations, I just am always... I always come back to how grateful I am that we do good work yeah. because I don't care about telling the story of success. If it's about like how much money we made or like how much, I don't know. There's just like a lot of stories of success that I'm like, that really doesn't resonate with me. Mm -hmm. um, but the weightiness and like I started the responsibility of telling this story I was thinking about for faculty members how much it resonates with them to say we believe in the power of higher education to change family trees. And we have the opportunity to share um, this, this opportunity with each other to lead students through to be successful. And so if we can just see them and, and help them, it will change their life and it will change the world for the better, right? So it's just such a nice, it's so nice to, to be doing good work that we should be very, very eager to learn how to talk about uh, really well. Yeah. 
All right, friends. Well, thanks for joining me. Um, I'm going to, so we have only a couple more uh, cap and gowns this semester, and then we usually take the summer off. But you guys will be happy to know Sherry's going to come back and be a regular for us. I think we get to have like a conversation a month um, oh, yeah. in the fall. So that will be really fun. I always appreciate our time together. Thanks for joining me. Yep. Thanks for having me. I love these. They're so fun. <laughs> I do too. Thank you guys for uh, joining us today and have a great day. Bye.